You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. For the community, by the community. For the community, by the community. On tonight's episode of Life and Style with Sarah, I'm celebrating the arrival of spring and anticipation of summer with some favorite clips from the archives. Stay tuned for Life and Style with Sarah, the best of spring. Sarah Connor, and while you're watching the Best of Spring show, I want to challenge you to a game. It's called Where in West Hartford. Using West Hartford's brand new green screen technology, I'll be on location, and it's your job to figure out where I am. My first spot is in this brand new, beautiful, and colorful garden. It's complete with rain barrels, compost bins, and even raised beds. I'll give you one hint. It was built by a team of eco-conscious little elves. While you're thinking about it, Jane Gaudier is going to give me some hints on how to plant seeds. Do seeds, um, it's pretty easy. It really it? is. It's, it's a lot of fun and I've been doing it for quite a few years mm -hmm. and every spring I, I, I'm excited to see what's coming yes. up. And what I usually do is this is a a, a container um, that you would get fast food in, you know, and mm -hmm. I just recycle. And these happen to be zinnias. And zinnias are one of my favorite annuals okay. for cutting and bringing in in the summertime. And I just start them in here. And when they get to be about this size, and mm -hmm. you can see they have their true leaves now, yep. um, I prick them out and I put them in either a peat pot or um, I have a couple of different peat pots here okay. that I put them in. And there's some little, this is kind of the same right. too, right? These little yep. individual teeny yep. tiny. And these can just pop right in the ground. Right. So these, these you don't need to take them out of the container. This is mm -hmm. actually a, a type of peat moss and it will break down in the soil and the roots will go right through that. So this is pretty thick. You <clears> just kind of sprinkle the yep, seeds and I let them go. I just sprinkle it on. So you don't just, have to be, you know, one, two, no, three. No. Oh, I do that, that and then I... That makes it really easy. Yeah, it really does, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. And yeah. what do you have growing over here? And this is some basil. Basil. Yep. See, and again, you just sprinkled a bunch of, of seeds in there. Yeah. I was so careful, and I did a couple seeds yeah. in each little yeah. container. Yeah. Um, I'm I, usually generous with the seeds. Yeah, you know, and it's fine right to just... Yep pull them apart when they get a little bit bigger. And what I usually do is I have um, a small tool called a, a dibble, or you can even use this. This is a popsicle stick, and you basically just wiggle your, your popsicle stick in there. Oh, look at that. And just pull it out. Yep. And then there's your root system. And I put it right in the ground. Oh, wow. So we can just... And then okay. it goes right into the peat pots. And you want to, you know, bury it with soil right up to here, right up to about okay. a quarter of an inch. Um, Look at that. Yeah. Wow, that's, yeah. So, that's even again, easier than what I was doing. This, this germinated <laughs> in about three days, three to five days as the needles will okay. come up. We do have grow lights, so that does, does help. But okay. you don't need to have any fancy equipment or grow okay. lights. You can use it, you know, put it right in your window. Just a nice southern exposure right. window. Yep. So what I did, which I want to take two minutes to share because mm -hmm. I was so excited about it. I had a tradition of doing seeds with my daughters on Mother's Day. Right. And then I decided that was kind of late because really by Mother's Day you can put things outside. Right. Yeah. So this year I moved it up to our spring vacation and a friend of mine had put a bug in my ear about using egg crates. And so this, I, over the winter I saved some egg crates and used those as instead of the peat pot, I just used the mm -hmm. egg crate and put the soil in sure. and then used the popsicle sticks in the little spots of the egg crates to label what it was that I did. And then mm -hmm. on the back, I put the date of when I put it in. So we can watch and see how long did it take right. for the seed yeah. to come up, which yeah. I thought it was, I had so much fun. I'm not sure my girls had as much <laughs> oh, fun as I did, yeah. <laughs> but I really, I, I had such a ball mm -hmm. and I felt, I felt good about that little trick. And mm -hmm. the, the popsicle sticks, I mean, my gosh, you can get you know, 150 of them for a dollar or something yeah. at yep. a, any craft store. Sure. So it's so, yeah. I mean, it's so easy mm -hmm. and, and it's, you know, similar to this. Mm -hmm. You're recycling yep. we containers, try to, to do as good. much recycling as, as possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the egg cartons are wonderful mm -hmm. and popsicle sticks. Um, you do want to use sterile potting soil. That would be the only thing that you'd yes. want to do when you're starting new seeds. Okay. 
Um, but yeah, it's a it's a, a really fun activity for for adults and children. For kids too, if you can life. get them yeah. to help you out. Yeah. It's fun. <laughs> I mean, it's fun to see. I see they, when they, once they start see them coming up, oh, yeah, that's, it'll be much more yeah. fun. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, one more question on the seeds, and then let's talk about plant to because okay, I know sure. you've been busy getting that started too. I have. You said sterile soil. So is that just yep. starter soil, like seed it starter is. It's started, soil? If you, again, go to any of the local garden centers mm -hmm. right here in West Hartford, and they will have, you know, potting soil. I use a of something called Pro Mix, which has vermiculite and perlite uh -huh. in it, and just makes the soil a little bit lighter. Okay. Um, but that is important for the seeds. Okay. You know, to have so you want to get a nice starter seed. A good seed start. Mix. Yep. Okay. Did you figure it out? This colorful garden was built by Norfelt Elementary School's green team. Now, students at Norfelt can learn firsthand how their food grows. My next clip is about a garden on a much bigger scale urban oaks. It's in the heart of New Britain. Owner Mike Candifer and author Terry Walters are in the greenhouse talking about this great urban farm. We're here in one of Urban Oaks greenhouses and this is a great example to see how we're using this space growing vertically as well as the abundance of greens that we grow here year round. Mike, maybe you can tell us about what we've got here now and how this is going to change over the year. Okay. Well, in the summertime, we grow a lot of cucumbers. Actually, we kind of harvested them yesterday, so I can't really show you. Oh, there's one there. We do a lot of cucumbers. You go down farther, there's cucumbers from India, Tibet, all over the place. In front of us, we have Italian lachinata kale. Behind us, we have some peppers. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we switch all seasons. So in the, in the wintertime, there'll be um, English sugar snap peas growing up. And the kales will still be growing, but then we switch over to salad greens. We do a lot of salad greens. So endives, escarole, 20 different kinds of lettuces. You know, the greenhouses, I'm surprised that this is growing in the middle of summer in the greenhouses. It doesn't get too hot in here? Um, well, this summer's been a little cooler. Um, Lachinata tends to take the heat much better than other kales. Other kales tend to rot out. Mm -hmm. It gets too hot for them, but the Lachinata is really tough. It is from Italy. It gets hot in Italy. Um, you keep it clean, it does fine. Wow. I, when I first started coming here, I, uh, Tony, who's one of the other founders of this farm, described the greens from the greenhouse for me as virgin greens because they don't have the rain coming down on them, so they're perfectly clean, and you can see they're just gorgeous. They're just screaming for me to take them home. <laughs> I just love them. My most frustrating time of the year is that, when is it, like February? January. January, February, when there's just not enough sunlight, and every week I come to the farm and I say, do we have any greens yet? And there's just not enough hours in the day of sun for the greens to grow, and then, boom, in March, all, we get all these different greens. There's so many varieties I never even knew of. Can you tell me, where? how do you know about all of these, and, and what are some of those great varieties? Well, my, in the low time of the year, which is January, February, when nothing's really growing, I sit and go through usually about 25 to 30 different seed catalogs. And now it's great because I finally get hit, hitched to the internet. Um, uh huh. Since Tony used to do all that, I wasn't allowed to touch the internet, but I'm finally doing that now. Um, just comb through seed catalogs and all over the place and look for different varieties. Mm -hmm. And we never go for the traditional stuff, we always look for things for varieties that taste good. We go for, yeah, we go for varieties with taste. Not for the storage like we most farms do. We go for, you know, unusual things. And is that because that's what's demanded? Because I know you provide to many restaurants locally as well. That's what they're interested in? Well, it's been that, but we've always been foodies, and we've always went to the food side of things. So yeah, we want stuff that tastes good, not, not, not that ship's good or store's good. We're always into the flavor. Because when I come in the winter months or the early spring, I see there's this beautiful uh, three or four different kinds of kale. The collard greens are amazing. The baby bok choy, the pak choy, the tat soy, all of the different Chinese uh, mustard greens. And uh, you can buy them individually or you can buy them in a bag where they're all mixed for soups or salads, which I think is just such a great way to bring these greens into your diet. Just bring them home and throw them with some beans in a pot of soup and see what you get. It's just such a great way to try. Of course, I also like to walk through the greenhouses and eat my way, you know, from one end to the other. The other thing that I've noticed while I'm standing here is that in addition to some of these summer um, vegetables, is as I walked down, we saw some really unusual things like the tomatillos growing, which I always thought 
were from Actually, Mexico. Those, those are strawberry husk tomatoes. They're a little different. They're the same family. Okay, so those smaller. were the husk tomatoes. Those are the husk tomatoes. Okay. And at the end, I saw a grapefruit tree in Connecticut. Yeah, we have some grapefruit trees. I actually bought the seeds back from the Caribbean in 2000. Um, actually, I kind of brought them back legally, but it's kind of late now. <laughs> um, they're actually white Caribbean grapefruit. They're, they have a lot of seeds in them, but the flavor is incredible. They're very sweet, and um, I've been picking fruit off them. This is going to be the fourth year coming up. Okay. Um, and I also saw a fig tree, and I could have sworn the last time I was here that that fig tree were, you know, maybe a foot or two inch well, we cut, we cut them, Yeah, we cut them back every winter. It's about three, four feet, and by the end of the summer, they're up to 20 feet, 25 feet. It's amazing. It's just amazing. And will I be able to buy those figs at the farm stand? You'll be able to buy those figs whenever they start ripening. Usually start picking them about the middle of July, but they're behind too because of the weather. Because of the weather. But they're loaded with figs. So, so we're just couple, waiting. Another sunny week and hopefully we'll start picking figs. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for showing us around the farm today. It's just been a great education and I hope that we'll see more of our friends coming to the farm on Fridays throughout the year. While Urban Oaks is in New Britain, this farm is right in the heart of West Hartford. Think you know where it is? Stay tuned to find out right after David Finn of Eaglewood Farms gives us a tour of his pig pen, literally. It's not just the food we're putting in our body, it's, you know, they're one of God's creatures too we gotta take care of. Right. So we are here actually in the, um, it's, I don't know, what do you, do you call it a pig pen? What do you call you it? call this a pig pen. A pig yeah. pen, we're literally in the pig pen. And these are all the, um, not the most recent piglets, right Dave? No. 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 These are wean piglets. What we do is bring them down from the main barn. We put them down here. The piglets you see with the little yellow ear tags are all going to be future breeders. They're... Next year they'll be having the piglets for Season. Okay, so the yellow tags are the future mamas. Uh, future mamas or sows after they've had a litter. Um, we have little one little boar hog in here. His name's Brutus. He's around, running around in the corner over there, but uh, <laughs> he will be a future breeder for all of these females. He's from a different litter. We watch our genetics to not interbreed. And we also have these little piglets that don't, and those are ones we usually have for sale. We still have a lot of people that come around and want to bring a couple of piglets on. Oh, okay. That's so you sell right you sell here. live piglets. We sell live piglets. Okay. And then what about the piglets that, that um, end up being pork? What are those? As these get a little bigger, um, they'll be moved back up into the barn, and they'll be called feeder pigs. Okay. And then they'll be grown up for the next four months, and then they'll be used as a meat product. Okay. How do you girls, after seeing the pigs, because we like pork, we eat pork as a family, we eat pork, how do you, does it change your mind about how you feel? Yeah. The eye, they are cute. Yeah. I'm not going to eat anymore. No, 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 really? No, honey, <laughs> let, let me explain this to you. Listen to what Dave has to say about that. There's nothing wrong. I mean, if you don't want to eat meat, that's your choice. But if you do, what you want to do is find out where the animals came from, who they treated with love and respect while they served this time on the earth to feed you. Yeah, I think that's true. And that's the right? great they thing. They look like they're happy. Yeah. yeah. The same West Hartford farm also has animals, but they're strictly for educational and observation purposes. Now after you've visited the farm, you may have the urge to clean and sanitize a little bit. In this next clip, Ann Wintz mixes up her recipe for an all-natural surface cleaner. It smells great and cleans well too. This is a surface cleaner and okay. I'm going to start with a basic surface cleaner and then show you how to boost it up. Alright, um, so surface cleaner just meaning tables, countertops, countertops, your sinks, not good for mirrors. Not mirrors. Not okay, mirrors. No mirrors. Um, your stove tops, refrigerator, okay. does a great job. And basically all this is, this is two cups of water and um, a half a cup of vinegar. Okay. Now to beef it up a little bit more, what we're going to do is we're going to add a teaspoon of borax. 
Now, borax, I was reading a book about, you know, natural cleaning and organic cleaning, and borax does a lot of great things. It does. Ants don't like it. If you have no. ants, they won't no. cross the borax if you sprinkle it around. Laundry booster. Laundry booster. It's fantastic. Yep, so this is borax. So we added a teaspoon of borax. We added a teaspoon of borax. And we're Two just cups of water. Half a cup of half vinegar. Half a cup of vinegar. Right. Teaspoon of borax. Right, and we're going to shake, shake that up. And that is just a great surface cleaner for all your countertops okay. and easy, inexpensive, mm -hmm. and you can make it, you know, from what you have in your kitchen. Now, if you want to use um, a surface cleaner for your bathrooms, especially your shower stalls and your bathtubs, okay, um, this is a wonderful additive. This is a natural uh, tea tree essential oil. All right. And we're going to add about 15 drops of the tea tree oil okay. to that. So it's more than just a scent. You're, it's, it's adding more, something else in there. It is, and it is a natural um, ingredient mm, that good. it does that fights yeah. mold and mildew. Okay. So you just want to shake that up really, really well, right. and then spray your tiles and your tub, okay. and it'll prevent the mildew. So the tea tree oil is good for the bathroom, prevents mold and mildew. Mildew. Could you use it for other surfaces? Yes, if, Even sure. if you weren't worried Absolutely. about mold and mildew? Yeah. Okay, so you okay. can still do countertops. Yeah. Exactly. If you're worried about using it on granite, um, I would test a little area, but a rule of thumb for any surface cleaners on granite okay. is if you spray your mitt and not your granite, and then wipe with your mitt or your sponge. So you're going to okay. spray the, the, so the surface be, cleaner. Let's demonstrate. <laughs> it would be like spraying, is this on? We're going to try and demonstrate here. There we go. I can't demonstrate. Oh, no, there we go. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so you spray mm -hmm. and then wipe. And then wipe. And we did make a mess. So this is good that we're doing it's, this. It's absolutely. So you just, so and if you want to protect your mm -hmm. granite, that's And it has a nice do. aroma to it. It does. It smells wonderful. That's great. So this is good for fighting mold and mildew. Mold and mildew. And vinegar surfaces. in and of itself is a good disinfectant, it is. right? It is. Yeah. Right. So that's great. If you and want it's cheap. It's Pennies. Really cheap. Pennies. Yeah. Pennies. I mean, it's amazing right. when you think how much you spend to buy a bottle of cleaner. Sure. And you can just make this. And when you actually read the ingredients, a lot of what you're buying is water. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, well, and then if you don't want the chemicals, right. you're buying mm -hmm. things you don't want. Yeah. So And that's I great. just save my old spray bottles that I've used, mm -hmm. you know, or you, you, you're out of something, you know, and right. I use the old bottles, that's wash them out is. really, really well. And, and my, my Sarah's solution. <laughs> My solution to all my problems. Love it. Um, but this is a reused bottle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as you're going in, as you're trying to get rid of your old stuff, right. you can reuse Recycle your spray your bottles. Stuff. Just clean them out well before yep. you use them. I'm now in a spot that has not only beautiful views, but also plenty of walking, hiking, and running trails. One trail even leads you up to a gorgeous panoramic view of the greater Hartford area. While you're giving that some thought, Come with me on a tour for an entirely different kind of trail, the Connecticut Wine Trail. And we're in Litchfield Hills and we're going to check out the Connecticut Wine Trail. First stop, Miranda Vineyard. This is the Revolve of Body Wine as it's a liberation of Hunter It's one of those hot and steamy days in mid-August. What better to do than to take a tour of the Connecticut Valley Winery? Uh, my dad is a dentist in Orange, uh, still is, and I was a private investigator. We started making wine in his basement about uh, 13, 14 years ago. Um, and we started making really good wine, so we kind of blew up from then. It's uh, about three and a half acres planted, so we planted um, about 16 different varieties. Uh, but that'll uh, destem the grapes, and we'll line like 30 of those up here. Um, put them about six inches from the top, add yeast to it for about two weeks. In those black buckets? Yep. Yep. Okay. And then um, after about two weeks, we'll mash it down by hand, get it nice and juicy, let the yeast take over. And then we'll uh, chunky pump it right into this Euro press. That's the P9 from Germany. It'll do a half ton at a time. Um, so we'll just press it. Um, it's a six cycle. Goes for about two to three hours per press, but it does a, a hell of a job, you know. Hmm. Um, and then we'll chunky pump it right into these tanks. Those are 264 gallon stainless steel tanks from Italy. We only use uh, stainless steel because uh, we don't like the taste of oak in our wines. We do add oak okay. more chips, but then we quickly rack it off 
because we don't like the taste of wood. For the past two years, all of our wines are 100% unfiltered. It takes a lot of the taste out, and we, we found that we won like a ton of awards more than we ever did if we didn't filter. We put all our wines in the smaller tanks before we bottle them, um, just so everything's tasting good, it's on the up and up. If we need to change anything, we can do it easily. The wines are phenomenal for mostly Connecticut grape here, so. Great, let's try it. Yeah, let's try it. <laughs> yeah. Ruby light, lighter in color, not calories. Don't get too excited. It's, <laughs> it's half red, half white, half our Frontenac and Chardonnay put together. Ruby. To be called a Connecticut wine, what is? What are the? It's the goals? state minimum is twenty five percent. It has to be twenty five percent your own grape. In that bottle, not in that bottle. On average, every one of these, every favorite. one of these has to have at least twenty five percent. Okay. Uh, your own grape or, yeah. right. or a Connecticut grown grape. Right. You can't call it a Connecticut grape yet. Yeah. To do what we're doing here is pretty truly amazing. Not to pat ourselves on the back, but yeah. it's pretty amazing. Yeah. So if you guessed that this gorgeous spot is Reservoir Six on Avon Mountain, you were right. And if you had no idea, you really should check it out. It's fantastic. Now stay tuned while I take a trip to my next Where in West Hartford location. This last location is perfect for picnickers, gardeners, and dog lovers alike. And newlyweds love it too. If you think you know, stay tuned after my last clip to find out. Louise Albin of Cafe Louise is going to share with us her recipe for chicken tarragon salad. And she's also going to share some tips for keeping food fresh on the road. Tarragon chicken salad with grapes and walnuts. Mm -hmm. You can also substitute pecans. You can leave out the nuts if you have family members allergies. or people that you know who mm -hmm. are allergic. Um, and it's a very simple salad, yet the flavors are wonderful. And it's the most requested salad we ever Really? We do, yes. It's and there really are not years. that many ingredients here. No, it's very That's simple. amazing. <laughs> So your secret, this is your secret recipe. That it is a secret you're recipe. Revealing. <laughs> <laughs> and it's basically poached uh, boneless, skinless chicken breast. And as I mentioned earlier, if people are too busy to poach the chicken, which is quite simple to do, mm -hmm. uh, buy the rotisserie chicken already at the right. grocery store and just take it off the bone and make it into bite-sized cubes. And then so that's. I'm just going to hold this up while you're talking about the rest of it, so we can kind of see the sizes. Yep. So this is cubed. Yes. This is a cube. Okay. And I know that in most grocery stores now you can get even you can get the rotisserie chicken, but you can also get grilled chicken or you can get, you know, the strips or the yeah. you know, or poached chicken or I've even seen a store that has this in a package really? done. Yeah. Like this shape and everything. I've I've actually used it. To, it saves time. I mean it's right. easy to poach, right. but if you're pressed, you want to take one step out of it. It's, yep. it's a good thing to save time on. So this is just plain poached okay. chicken breast that's been cubed. This, as we mentioned earlier, also very easy to do in advance, mm -hmm. two, three days in advance, or freeze it. And then it's right. ready, ready to go to make your chicken salad at any time. How long will cooked chicken last in the fridge? How long Usually they long? say two, three days. Okay. So three days of the outside. Three days. Really? Okay. okay. Three days to be safe. So then the other ingredients we have. And then here we have uh, just red seedless grapes okay. that have been cut in half, washed and cut in half. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to add them to the bowl. This Could you do cherries or some other fruit or just grapes really? Dried fruit. We do, dried fruit. Yes. Okay. Sometimes in the fall we'll do some with like a dried Bing cherry, a dried blueberry with nuts is also very nice. Mm, that does sound good. It's nice Apricots to experiment. Apricots maybe? Or? Apricots would be good. Whatever, you're, okay. whatever you like. Your taste. Okay. Uh, these are some walnuts. They're, do you toast the walnuts? They're better if they're toasted. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure if these are or okay. not. Um, toasting nuts brings out the flavor. It does. It's such a yum. As long as you don't burn them, which I do frequently, right. I put them in, I think I can't forget these, and then all of a sudden I smell the burn. It's quick. You can burn either nuts. do them mm -hmm. in the oven, in a low oven, for like five to eight minutes. Right. You can actually do them in a fry pan as well. Just but a dry same, pan. Just a dry mm -hmm. pan. But same thing, you have to really watch. This is dried tarragon. Uh, it's that time of year where if you grow fresh herbs like I do, you can also pick it from uh, your herb garden and and this takes a while. What's nice about doing this salad at least a day in advance is it gives, if it's dried tarragon or dried herbs you're using, it gives it um, a while to open up because they take, 
at least three, four, like half a day before yeah. all the flavors right. really open up and meld together. Mm -hmm. And then we're just going to add some mayo. Now, back to the food safety with the mayo, um, what is the, you don't want it to get too hot. It, Boy, I mean, what is the range of time that you can have something out away from the ice before it? Oh, a couple goes. hours, depending on how okay. hot it is. Although okay. uh, I do get a lot of calls from people who say, "Can we, um, if they're ordering something, mm -hmm. um, can we avoid foods with mayo?" And that's really like an old. It's almost becoming like an old wives' tale. Mayo is so highly, the way it's made today is so highly acidic that it's actually mm -hmm. safe. If anything were to make you sick and be out in the open for mm -hmm. a long time, chances are it would be the potatoes that are in your salad. Potatoes? And the uh, potatoes really? you also have to be careful really? of. Really? Yes. See, I always thought it was the mayonnaise on the potatoes. No. <laughs> oh, and the, the proteins, okay. whether it's a seafood or your chicken, your egg salad, it's more. Okay, so it's the protein, not the mayonnaise. Yes. Interesting. Okay. Because supposedly they say nowadays that mayo is so highly acidic, and, you know, unless you're making it from scratch. Right. Which, so this is assuming you're buying it from a store, right. not making it yourself. That okay. it can, it's actually safe to just leave out and not refrigerate it. I wouldn't do that, but I have yeah, heard that. Interesting. So okay. I always worry about eggs too, for some reason, yes. more so than even a chicken yes. salad. And I don't know if it's just my thing or. Well, I think my mom is is very very careful with anything that's a day past its expiration date is out of the refrigerator. She's very very careful about that. So I think I have a little bit of that in me, and my husband will eat leftovers that are what I think are well beyond edible, but he, you know, he's like, oh, it's fine. So I've got two families that are very different um, in that. And eggs, um, we went to a wedding in Scotland, and it was this beautiful location where they provided food for you, and it was like an apartment, and then they would provide food for the guests. And you walk into the apartment, and there was a basket of raw eggs just sitting out. And you didn't, I thought, oh, I've got to put these in the refrigerator right away. But apparently, in, I have a friend who's from Ireland. She said, oh, no, raw eggs we keep out. It's the cooked eggs that we put in the refrigerator. Oh, funny. Yes, I heard that in Japan. Yeah. And I lived in France in the mid-70s, and it's amazing what they did not refrigerate for right. days that we, you right. know, we would And maybe think. they're just so fresh. I don't know if it has to do with how fresh they are, but I get nervous about that, too, with the eggs. So, so this is basically it, salt and pepper okay. to taste. It's, Very easy. It's sort of, um, as far as in the food color and world, food color world, mm -hmm. I sort of call this vanilla because it doesn't have a lot of color. The bowl spices. But the bowl <laughs> is pretty. Doing it in a bed of greens, yep. you know, adding. This is a pretty sage flower from my garden. You know, that's adding, typical sage with a. a this I didn't is no sage flowered. Neither did I till this year. <laughs> <laughs> that was left to grow long enough. Nice. Or some Beautiful. other little edible flowers. We have Johnny okay. Jump Ups here. So we can this here. show how we're... Very nice. You have to clean up the bowl, of course. Right. So that would be a nice way to display it. One last hint. This location is actually on the Hartford-West Hartford line. And these arches will soon be covered with roses. You got it, Elizabeth Park. Well, that's it for our game. And the show is over. I'm Sarah Connor, and you've been watching Life and Style with Sarah. Don't forget to tune in next month to a brand new episode.